Hey, good afternoon everyone, it's TrackMan44 here. You know, I did that part one of a bunch of the old tools stuff sitting around my shop, and I told you it was going to be a part two. Well, in talking with the much older brother, the much older brother decided that uh, he had a few things from, from the old home place, uh, from our, our grandfather's side on my dad's side, and also our great-grandfather's side on our grandmother's side, if that makes sense. But anyway, there's a combination of items from, uh, from those two uh, areas. And I'm going to try to get him to talk a little bit about some of them because I don't know a whole lot about them, you know. But uh, to make a long story short, i got a table full of stuff here just kind of sitting. And I'm sure a lot of guys are familiar with it. Uh, first and foremost, the very first thing he's got sitting right here is a, a bona fide Ford. I'm assuming it's going to be a Ford Model T wrench. Of course, it's adjustable. And of course, this here is for your transmission drain plug and maybe even the engine drain. I don't know. That's really pretty cool. Very next thing he's got sitting right here is um, an old, I don't know if it's handmade, blacksmith shop made or whatever, but it's a C-clamp uh, made entirely wooden. And of course it's got the wooden threads and the whole bit. And if you're familiar with how the old time guys uh, made those threads, you can see right here, this is your thread die. You would make your doll pin, I guess you would use a draw knife or whatever, make the, the doll pin reasonably round, and then you would slowly cut the threads. There's a knife that inserts right down into the crack, and you just have to uh, make sure the knife is sharp and slowly cut, little by little, the threads down the length. And these came from our great-grandfathers on our grandmother's side. And then, of course, here's the much, much larger size, and you can see where the bits are actually uh, driven right down through these and then adjusted to just to where they cut the shavings right off of your wood to create your threads. I think this one's set up for two cutters, even though there's only one there. And this cutter is actually a V-shape, so it looks like some of the shavings might actually come right out this hole. That's kind of interesting. I just flat don't know. And of course, you have to have the female portion for these, for the threads. And so here's your, uh, here's your tap. This is going to be your die. This is going to be your tap. And if I ran it in there, you'd see this is just going to go right on in just like that. Now that's pretty unique because in all the junk I've seen, I've not seen one of these before today. So um, much older brother got me on one. And we had a little blacksmith out there at the, at the old home place. Uh, he was gone before I came around. You know, he's much older brother, so much older than I am. He's got a lot more memories, you know, because he's around a lot longer. Uh, the old man's name was Albert Vogt. We always, I always heard him referred to as Mr. Vogt. Mr. Vogt was very innovative. He did a lot of things he built um, he built everything you can possibly imagine in and around the farm. And he worked all the way through the depression and everything. And then they closed up the blacksmith shop probably in what year? About when? Late in 30s sometime. Late 1930s yeah. or so, yeah. maybe early yeah. 40s, about, about the time the war yeah. broke out. But he came up with this innovative idea for making a crop cutter. And this is a, a walnut contraption. I call it a contraption simply because it's, it's just made in the blacksmith shop. It all comes apart. You can pull the pin, you can take this thing apart. But what you do is you pull your knife out right here. This knife comes out by pulling a pin. You slip a turnip onto the knife and you stick it in. You can see how the, the shape of the knife. And up here you can see a bunch of knives. They were just sharp pieces of um, hand saw blade. Yeah. Just sharp pieces that he cut off and drove into little slots up there in grooves about 3 sixteenths of an inch or a quarter of an inch in width. And you just put a little pressure down on the top of it as you turn the crank over your crock. And of course, as you turn the crank, your turnip goes around and around and it shoots the kraut curlings right out of the top of it and right down into your, uh, your crock. And this happens to be uh, one of two that we found out there whenever we was actually going through the material and setting up for the sale. Whenever everybody died, the last ones are gone. And uh, my much older bro brother brought all those parts and pieces home and he assembled this one here from new old homemade stock and then assembled the second one for myself and I've got it down on my, uh, on my display shelf as well. But these are authentically made in the, uh, in the blacksmith shop back on the farm before I was born. Our two uncles were deal of Val cream separator uh, dealers. And so right here we still have a brand spanking new half gallon of uh, cream separator oil unopened. Still got the seal on it. And it's a little bit, uh, looks like it's oily and stuff because he kind of washed them all down, you know, to get all the grit and grime off of them, you know, so we can show you how pretty they were. And our uncle sold this here for a dollar and thirty cents. He got the grease pencil marking right there for a dollar thirty. And this is for your pulso pump. This is another unopened, fresh container of deal about pulso, pulso pump oil. And again, this is from uh, the 1930s or 40s. Somewhere around the 30s yeah, and the 40s. Yeah, you know, our old man, you know, he was, 
he had a tough time explaining different ideas that he would have, but if you cut him loose, you could go ahead and do something, and you would sit back and observe, and then you could uh, see what he's doing, and then learn by observation. I don't know if he was that way with my much older brother, but that's the way he was with me, you know what I mean? I guess he got tired of explaining stuff. But we had these old mall chainsaws out there, and they had these, uh, what they call a shark tooth chain. Now, I'm not familiar with that, you know, <laughs> but I had been on the business end of those old chainsaws back whenever I was way much younger than what I am now. Fortunately then, you know, they in ended up with a McCulloch one-man saw by the time I really got big enough to do any work. But at any rate, you had to trim the rakers on the side of those of that shark tooth chain. And the old man sketched this thing out and he gave it to... Bill Madison. Gave it to a gentleman called Bill Madison, who was a machinist, I guess, at the local factory. Yep. And this is one of the government projects we talked about on the other video, you know, about a circular saw jig. But he took it down to the factory and in the machine shop, he made this jig. Now this jig secures a file right inside here, along this right here. And then you would run this and you adjust the three right here to get the angle or the distance you want away from the blade for the rakers. And then you would slide this down the length of your bar. And then you would rotate the chain until you go all the way around it. Then you do the same thing on the other side. Well, at one time, I'll let you tell this part of the story. You want to tell this part of the story? I can't get him to talk. Now here's how things happen sometimes. You know, I just described to you how this, uh, how this came about. And this is the original that my dad had uh, his buddy, Mr. Madison, make down at the, at the factory. As soon as they realized how good it worked, my uncle Davey, we always call him Uncle Chippo, he took this up to the, to the mall dealership or distributorship in St. Louis. I think it was Allied Equipment, according to, uh, or to my brother. He showed it to the salesman. Of course, the salesman looked at it and they really thought that was cool. And um, kind of sketched a couple of little bit of sketches, you know, about it and everything, you know. And then in no time at all, like within just a, just a matter of months, Allied Equipment was selling these commercially to the, mall, uh, to the mall owners out there. So that's how quick and simple you can have an idea that takes off, but you miss the opportunity to, uh, to be able to retire early. You know what I mean? That's just one of many things that happened out around the farm and uh, the, the creativeness of the old timers. It's just one of the many things that just happened over the years. Everybody knows what a plumb bob is, but how many of you have a retractable reel on your plumb bob? It's a little gummed up, and I don't think it's a spring return, but it's really cool. Never even seen one like that before. And by the way, this is a brass reel in here, and it's got knurlings on the side for your thumb to uh, gain traction on it whenever you reel it back up. And of course, here's a real old shoe cobbler's hammer. It's still got the, the original handle in it. It says Old Hickory, of course. The little cobbler's hammer and I've got some of the old shoe lasts with all the different size from baby shoes all the way up to to big guys feet you know that you set on the little uh, shoe last that you set on the little stand and it sit there and they drive nails and stuff in you know for new soles and all that this is a brand new plum perma bond hatchet he claims it's never never struck a piece of wood and I kind of believe it uh, because it doesn't have any markings on it whatsoever and it's a newer one it's not really that old uh, you can tell it's newer because it's got the resin or the epoxy or whatever it is, you know, sealing the handle into the end of the head. But still, it's brand spanking new. Now here's a hatch that's seen a little bit of abuse. Don't know anything about that, but it kind of looks like a tomahawk, you know. All right, now, our great-grandfather on our grandmother's side, actually our, our grandmother's father, uh, they had a whole ton of kids, my gosh. I think they had 15. 16. 16 kids. And, uh, she was in the middle. And what? She was in the middle. Oh, yeah. And our grandmother was right in the middle of the 16 kids. I think they had a couple of babies that didn't make it and stuff like yeah, that, you yeah, know. Yeah. But it was a pretty good pile of, pile of kids. He passed away many, many years ago. And our one uncle started living in the old house and everything. Well, he wanted to add, put an addition on. And so he had a two-room addition added to one side of the two-story uh, two brick house. And my much older brother was out there one day whenever they were tearing off an old porch and everything. Of course, there's rafters and there's tin and all that stuff. And they ripped the old porch off of the uh, the old house. And son of a gun, if my brother didn't find the brass-ended tamping stick for our great-grandfather's old muzzleloader. You got any idea? Would that have been a muzzleloading shotgun? A shotgun. A muzzle a muzzleloading shotgun, shotgun because yeah. of the bore. My God, that looks like it's a half, half inch <laughs> diameter. Probably but that's how old that is. Now, unfortunately, the end is broken off of it and was broken off of it when he yeah. found it. But he's had that thing now for, my God, 60 years, 65 years or yeah. better. This is also a couple of spoke shaves that came from, uh, from our grand great-grandfather's place out there on, the, on that particular farm. These are actually threaded right here. You back these off and that entire knife comes right out the front of that spoke shave. 
And of course you can adjust, I think, the amount that you take off by the adjustment of these also, but I'm not sure about that. And of course it's got a brass wear plate on the front of it. Here's another one that uh, there's no attachments on the back side, so you can see how the blade actually comes out of this one here. And there was probably some wedges in there to hold it where you wanted it. Oh yeah. Probably was some wedges in there. But that's, I guess they would call that a uh, primitive. How many Boy Scouts we have out there? Now, I was never a Boy Scout. <laughs> I was always a Girl Scout. But I quit once I found one, you know. But here's an actual Boy Scout plum Boy Scout hatchet. It's just as plain as day. You can see the Boy Scouts of America emblem right on the front. And, of course, you can see the plum. It's very well defined. And it is in excellent, excellent condition. And here's another one, a second one, that's in even better condition. I didn't even know they had such a thing. And there he's got two of them. And of course, hey, the other day I made a mistake on the first video. Well, I, I learned something from just about every video I put up because there's always commenters that know more about things than what I do. And that's the honest truth. But I referred to these uh, hewing hatchets as though they were hewing hatchets, which is what I've always heard them called. But actually it turned out that some of those hatchets that are shaped like a broad axe are actually shingling hatchets. And what they're used for is to trim shingles or whatever and drive nails. Um, you know, whenever you're putting the cedar shakes on the sides of the houses and the cedar shingles up on the roof. But at any rate, this is an actual shingling hammer for asphalt shingles. And of course, this is your gauge right here. You would set your, hook your gauge on a shingle and slide it up, you know, and then that'd be your depth, you know, that you would set it so to maintain a nice even course all the way across the roof. Another real good old uh, Winchester. But this is, uh, this got a broken axe handle, a pole axe handle that's been whittled down and put in the head. This is a, uh, got the markings of our dad written all over it because he made a wedge down here out of wood to fill up the part of the eye. There's ice tongs, another good old uh, universal hatchet. And again, this is another broken pole axe handle that was driven into that. You know, like I said, them old timers, they didn't go to the hardware store and just buy something new, you know. They'd grab a chunk of hickory, you know, off a sawmill or a, or a piece of ash or whatever. They'd go in and grab the draw knife, sit there at the bench vise, and they'd go ahead and whittle them out something new. Or they would save the old handles, and I'm guilty of it to this day, and so is my, my much older brother. Anytime we break a handle, well, we save the handle because we figured we could saw it off and use it somewhere else. And that's exactly what they did on these several hatchets right here. And if you've got any railroad buffs out here, you'll know exactly what this is right here. This is a cold cut. Them old guys, you know, would sit back and hold another guy's swing and then go ahead and whack it. You know, we had them in the blacksmith shop, but uh, ours were just beat all the heck. This thing here is in excellent condition. Brand new, never been used, mowing side blade. Now these mowing size, this is a, this is actually a small one here. This here is only 18 inch or so. But my gosh, some of them mowing size, how big is the biggest one you've seen? Three foot. Three foot, 36 inch. That's some of the big ones. But I got one or two down at my house myself. Now we have a real man's act right here. Now take a look at this guy right here. Of course the handle's broke, you can tell that. Do you think this one's seen a little bit of abuse? I'd say so. Now last week I showed you a brush hook. I made the comment maybe on that video that sometimes they sharpen both sides of this brush hook. You can see this front side right here is, is sharpened as well as the back side. It really comes in handy. A lot of times you can reach up inside there, you can give it a jerk and you can cut small branches off, you know, just with this hook by giving a jerk backwards on it, you know what I mean? And this was the old man's, this was our dad's uh, one of his, probably his favorite. You can see the Shapley hardware stamp right there. But uh, this came up real up close and personal to me one time. I was a little boy. I was literally, literally a small boy. And I'm sitting on the ground while the old man's clearing fence row. I don't know, it might have been lunchtime or something, eating peanut butter and jelly, I don't know. And the old man got his feet tangled, tangled up in some, uh, some vines and they stumbled backwards about the time he had that thing up over his head. And I dang here he come falling towards me. And I threw my arm up like this right here as I rolled off the side as I remember. And I dang, he caught me right alongside the wrist right here. And I still got about a three quarter inch scar. Now, you know, I, I thought I was dying, you know what I mean? But uh, I still got that scar from the time I was just a little bee shaver. And then he put some chewing tobacco on it? Yeah, yeah, he sure did. That's what we do. Every time we'd get hurt, I dang, he'd pinch off a piece of chewing tobacco and give it to you and wrap your old snotty handkerchief around it to hold it in place. <laughs> and you know, that's good for you, you know? Hell, there's one time, <laughs> there's one time we're rebaling hay that the rats got into a barn at my cousin's house and ate the doggone strings off of about half the bales, you know. And so we're in there, we're forking this loose hay outside the, the door of the barn, and my dad and my Uncle John, they were actually forking it again into the baler, just sitting there, and then pushing the bales out the back and back onto the wagon. And my cousin Jim, and I'm standing in front of him, you know, like I typically am doing, I'm sitting there resting, I got my hand on the handle like this, and you know, I'm just kind of resting, you know. Hey, it was hot. And Jim 
pitchfork standing in front of me got hooked onto a string and he'd give it a little bit of a, a push like that and that string broke loose and those three three prongs of that pitchfork come flying right up at me but it, two of them went right on either side of that doggone pitchfork I'm leaning on and it come right up here completely through my arm and I remember looking right across my arm at my net at my cousin's eyes and his eyeballs about as big as that like that and I remember just jerking my arm off like that and I had just little bubbles of blood come out did hit no no arteries, nothing like that, you know. And the old man, he just pinched off some chewing tobacco and had me poke him on there, you know, and then just tied him up and everything. And whenever we got home in that evening and then told my sister, <laughs> told my sister what had happened, oh boy, she just got mad at him as all Dickens and made him take me over to the doctor and give me a tetanus shot. So, uh, you know, that's just a sidebar story, but that's a true story. For a long time, I had those little those little hole, hole mark uh, scars on the arm. <laughs> They're gone now. Don't go away. Come back over there. I'm camera shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to break your camera. Take my picture. Well, he's afraid he's going to do some uh, damage to my camera, you know. I tried to get him to talk a little bit. He's one of them guys, once you get him talking, you can't hardly get him to stop. But at any rate, like I told you before, he doesn't hardly throw away anything. Uh, if he does, I guarantee it ain't got no value to it. He's worse than I am, and I'm pretty doggone bad. We really enjoyed the, the opportunity to go through some of this stuff, and as obviously you can tell, this is just a, just a smidgen, just a small portion of what we're surrounded with out here. Like I said, he's so much older than I am, he's had the opportunity to collect a much longer period of time, you know? Even though the women, the women think he's younger than me. Boy, I tell you, can you believe that? Look at that old fart. He's a hell of a lot older than I am, man. One last item you guys are really gonna enjoy. Now, remember we were talking about uh, Mr. Vogt, Albert Vogt the old blacksmith out there. Um, as a surprise for my brother's 10th Christmas, I guess, it was um, December 25th, 1949. Mr. Vogt, my dad had contracted with Mr. Vogt. Of course, he probably didn't pay nothing. Probably just a buddy-buddy deal, you know what I mean? But uh, Mr. Vogt made this, uh, made this handmade wagon all the way down to the fellows of the wheels, the spokes, you know, the boxings, the bearings, everything, axles, uh, bolster, wagon bed and everything uh, completely by hand for for Glennon uh, for his 10th Christmas like I said in 1949. The bed on it is uh, is walnut. This is all walnut and painted green and of course uh, everything else is all made out of oak and everything is authentically made like a just like the regular wagons the full-size wagons that uh, that Mr. Volk would make you know in the blacksmith shop or make repairs on in the blacksmith shop and let's we'll take the bed off of it here real quick and just set her down here. Got a coupling, coupling pin inside here. You pull your coupling pin, you can stand it all out if you wanted to, to haul longer you know, pieces of wood or whatever you want to do in it. Uh, but of course, they would typically use this to haul grain feed, you know, in sacks down to the chicken house from up at the, uh, the hammer mill. And of course, you can see when you turn the corner, your bolster is going to allow the, the front wheels in order to turn. But everything is just a mini miniature miniature horse drawn wagon. One of the few things that's different is he told me that whenever Mr. Vogt made it, he just had a 3 8 rod up here at the top and it kind of hurt their fingers and hurt their hand a little bit for pulling in heavy uh, loads of, of uh, feed, those sacks, five sacks of feed. Hell, they're probably 100 pounds, you know, in a sack back in the day. And the old man took that off. Did he put a whole new handle on or nope, just, just this? Handle. Okay, just this metal part up here. The old man changed it and put this D ring up here with that big wooden round, which was much easier on the boy's hands. Now I got to play in this thing a lot whenever I was a little boy, and he didn't know about it because it set out underneath the uh, set underneath the back room. Yeah. And I'd pull it out, man. I'd go flying off down the sidewalk and head to a chicken house. And if he'd known that, he probably would have beat me. You know what I mean? But he never did. Never did catch me. But see, here's your bolster just comes right off. He's got metal wear plates and everything. I'm sure they squirt a little oil on it, you know, over a period of time. And of course, that bolster goes right down through the coupling pin right here. But uh, it's just as neat as can be. And like I said, um, he made all the fellows, the spokes, the hubs, everything, all by hand. It's just a pretty cool thing. This is the same year that he got his erector set <laughs> that he still has in the, in the house right now, put up on the shelf. Mr. Volt made another little wagon. Is it same, just like this? or yeah, A little bit bigger. A little bit bigger than this uh, for one of our aunts. He had to do a little work on it for her. What did you have to do to it? He had, he had Mr. Volt that made a set of shafts for her, for a billy goat to pull it. And then uh, she had me take the shafts off and make a handle so they could pull it by uh, hand. But Mr. Volt made, uh, made the harness for the billy goat and everything. 
I'll be darned. That's Billy Goat used to pull her around out there. I yeah. got a picture. I got a picture of her and uh, with that dead gimbal Billy Goat. Yeah. I'll be damned. Yeah. She's on the, with the wagon. I don't remember the wagon, but I got a picture of her and that damned old Billy Goat. Mm -hmm. He had made another wagon that we had out there on the, that we kept on the farm. He made it for our youngest uncle, but it just stayed out there on the farm. We, we call it the milk hack because a little guy like me, I'd have to pull the milk crayons up to the, the can cooler, you know, in the evening time whenever we're milking and filling with cream, they would load those uh, 10 gallon milk containers into the milk hack and I'd drag it up to the to the can cooler and of course the adults would have to go ahead and pull them out of the milk hack and set them into the cooler to chill down overnight or until we shipped them, uh, you know, to the, take them to the train station for shipping to St. Louis. But anyway, I don't know whatever happened to the old milk hack. It was taken out to Arthur's. Okay. So our uncle ended up with that, so it's, it's I don't know what. Hopefully it's still in existence. But it was a little little tattered and torn, a little broken down a little more because it was used consistently and considerably. I don't think this one was used quite as much, and now Pauline's wasn't probably used as much no, as, no. as this one either. But at any rate, guys, like I told you, he never throws a thing away. And it's been a fun afternoon looking and uh, reminiscing with some of the stuff that he's uh, he's really in. And uh, so you know what? If I can step into the picture a little bit, come on. I break your camera, man. This is Tractor Forty. Tra this is Tractor Man Forty Four, <laughs> and his much older brother. And we are out of here, guys. We're gone, man. <laughs>